We're saving seals in Vancouver. Oh, there she is. Oh my gosh, they're so adorable. Hey, buddy. Saving money in Warsaw. and heading to what might not be the cheapest, but is certainly the rudest restaurant in Sydney. Messy. I don't want your leftovers. This week, I'm on Canada's Pacific coast, where Vancouver lies in the shadow of a mountain range that is the only barrier between the city and one of the world's most vast wildernesses. Surrounded by water, every year thousands of people travel here to marvel at the whales as they dance along the coastline, returning after a long winter away. British Columbia is the most biodiverse territory in all of Canada. It's got seals, it's got sea lions and hundreds of other species living in these very waters. But it's also home to the biggest port in the entire country, Vancouver. And when you bring animals and humans and you put them in such close quarters, problems can arise. More boats means more underwater noise, which can confuse animals, leading them into trouble. Last year alone, the local marine mammal rescue center, funded by the aquarium, helped over 100 animals to safety. Some were injured, others simply distressed and confused. Two of them ended up here. Oh, there she is. Oh my gosh, they're so adorable. Hey, buddy. Hey, Pim. How do they end up here? Yeah, so they were rescued um, this past summer by our Marine Mammal Rescue Center. Um, they were found in different areas and they kind of didn't look like they were doing too well. Um, Pim had a couple injuries. Uh, Skeena was looking really dehydrated and skinny. And then upon them kind of getting nursed back to health, it was found out that Pim had um, cataracts and the injuries to Skeena's eyes were too severe, so they both have lost their vision. Clearly, the ocean can be a cruel place, and there are currently nine other marine mammals at the aquarium who, just like these two, were rescued from near death, but sadly, after rehabilitation, weren't well enough to be released back into the wild. Their neighbor, Senor Cinco, was also blinded after sustaining a gunshot to the face. He's quite the character, and now acts as an ambassador for the work of the rescue team. So when people come through and you know visit the aquarium, come say hi to the seals and the sea lions, what do you hope that they come away with from that visit? I hope they just come away with a, a bit more of a stronger connection to the ocean. I think that's the really cool thing about aquariums is um, sometimes the creatures in the ocean or even just the ecosystem of the ocean is not a tangible thing because you're watching it on TV or you're reading a book. But I think when you get to come and see it in person and make that emotional connection, you can really understand what is out there um, and maybe have a stronger pull to take action in their lives to help with climate change or protect the oceans. That's one of my hopes for the visitors that come to the aquarium. And maybe now, more than ever, that inspiration is important. This is how much rubbish ends up on 100 meters of coastlines every single day. With that amount of plastic bobbing around, it's no wonder a big part of the rescue center's work is disentangling curious animals that get caught up in it. Down in Horseshoe Bay, Vancouver's busiest passenger ferry port. Hi, Eva. Hi, great to see you. Lindsay and her team are getting ready to go out on one of these disentanglement trips. And I'm hoping to help. My name is uh, Megan. I'm going to be your driver today. And we also have Thomas riding along with us as well as our deckhand. So when we give you the thumbs up, we're just going to walk from the nice hard surface, which is the dock. Ooh. I haven't got great sea legs, so I'm really hoping the weather stays like this. The giant ferries looming alongside our tiny boat remind me of the scale of the human impact here. 
And where we're heading into is Hao Sound, and it's rich in marine life. Hao Sound, or at Katsum, as it's called in the local Squamish language, lies just north of the city in the Salish Sea. In the summertime, when it's seal popping season, we get lots of calls from animals around here. But will we find any today that need our help? It doesn't take us long to come across some sunbathing sea lions. Oh, they're so cute! Oh my gosh, it's <laughs> right there! <laughs> so far, we can see um, they all look to be in pretty decent condition. Uh, no entanglements. There's some young ones in there, which is really cool to see, mums and pups, and there's some older animals, but body condition-wise, I'd say they're, they're doing okay. Sadly, this isn't always the case. Recently, Lindsay and her team found this sea lion struggling with a wire wrapped around its neck. Thanks to the skill of the team, they were able to tranquilize it, to set it free. Luckily, this lot are okay, but trips like this aren't wasted. Counting the sea lions is still a crucial part of the wider conservation effort in the area. Only a couple of years ago, this coastal fjord was designated a UNESCO biosphere zone, recognizing the effort being made to boost the biodiversity here. A pretty impressive achievement when you consider that for decades, coastal industry left the water here heavily polluted. How would you say the numbers have changed throughout the years? Definitely, definitely noticing uh, an increase in numbers of, of the sea lions and specifically in different areas. A little bit closer to Vancouver area, 10 years ago, we weren't seeing stellar sea lions in some of these areas, um, and now we're seeing both California and, and stellar sea lions. And only a couple of months ago, plans were announced to protect a swathe of marine coastline the size of Iceland near British Columbia. It's hugely important. I mean, we live in an amazing part of the world. Uh, it brings in a lot of tourism, a lot of um, ecotourism. Well, you almost have to pinch yourself once in a while. I mean, you, right now we're sitting in a boat. We've got a hundred plus sea lions, a hundred feet from us, and we're just having a conversation. Like, it's, it's insane to think about that. And you know, there could be whales around the corner. And there's just so much that, that British Columbia offers. Preserving that, well, obviously it's, it's going to be helpful for years. And with humans encroaching ever further into Mother Nature's territory, these animals are going to continue to need all the help we can give them. It can be really easy to take for granted the wildlife in places like this, but what I've learned today is just how much effort goes into protecting these waters and the animals that live in them. It's definitely a careful balance, but it seems like things are moving in the right direction. As for me, I think I'm ready to head back to dry land. And if you're planning to visit Vancouver anytime soon, here's some things you should know. There are several walking tours, museums and exhibitions here that will help you understand a bit more about Vancouver's indigenous people. The city is built on land belonging to the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. And if you start to feel peckish, why not track down some bannock, a sort of indigenous bread you can pick up in several spots around the city. It's sometimes used in cakes, waffles, or just eaten on its own. Mmm, that is so delicious. The best way to explore Vancouver is on foot. The Vancouver Seawall is a 17 and a half mile long walk that exposes you to the best of the city, from artwork and sculptures to mountains and wildlife. Seals are often spotted, and the endangered Great Blue Heron has made a home next to the tennis courts just watch out for the coyotes. And if you're heading here over the winter, the city's got three popular ski resorts, all accessible by public transport. Cyprus is the biggest and most expensive, but Grouse and Seymour are both well set up for families. The big deal here, though, is the world-famous Whistler Mountain, a two-hour bus ride away. It's pricey. A day pass this season started at 143 Canadian dollars, or about 105 US. But for that, you get access to North America's biggest ski resort with 200 different runs, reliable snow, and some of the most beautiful mountain scenery on Earth. Still to come on The Travel Show. Albania is beginning to emerge as a destination in its own right. 
Simon's got tips on how to save money in Europe. Thank you. You're welcome. So Menus together. And we certainly won't be leaving any at Sydney's rudest restaurant. The what? The tropical parrot. You don't need to shout. So don't go away. Welcome back to Vancouver on Canada's west coast. Believe it or not, but this lovely beach right here is smack bang in the middle of the city. No complaints from me. Up next, here's Simon with some great money-saving tips if you're planning on visiting Europe anytime soon. Hello from Brighton. This English seaside city has been attracting visitors in search of fun, frolics and sea air for centuries. It's got me all excited about the imminent prospects of summer. And I've been doing some maths to calculate the most cost-effective locations in Europe this year. First though, the United States has dropped its insistence that all international travellers should be fully vaccinated against Covid. The change, ordered by the White House after 18 months of the rule, means that New York, Florida, California and the rest of the US are now open for visitors this summer. It's been a long, wet winter in the UK, but at least the sun is out today in Brighton. And I wanted to try to bring a ray of light to all the people who want to get away, but are really feeling the high cost of living. With that in mind, I've created a price index. Prices in Rome are above average for every aspect, particularly fast food and budget accommodation. London and Paris have the most expensive airport to city transport. A large beer in the French capital will cost you more than twice as much as the cheapest, which, like every item I surveyed, is in Warsaw. So I applied my holiday price index to the Albanian capital, Tirana, and found that costs are around half of those in Warsaw. Albania, tucked on the Adriatic coast, for decades has been in the shadow of more illustrious neighbours like Greece, Montenegro and Croatia, but now it's beginning to emerge as a destination in its own right. I led something of a pioneering tour there in 1989 to see England play a World Cup qualifying match against Albania. To find out how things are in 2023, I've caught up Francesca Mazzotti of AlbaniaInsider.com. When I first visited Albania in the 1980s, I was struck by how friendly it is. Is that still the case? In my opinion, it's the friendliest country I have ever been. If you need the help, Albanians are here to help you. If you need everything, they, were, they are very, very happy to help you. I also love Lake Ohrid. Lake Ohrid is one of the most spectacular places you will see not just in Albania but in the Balkans. It is nestled between Albania and North Macedonia. It is an amazing place off the radar. You will not find crowds there, not even in summertime. I'm also interested in Dures. The most interesting thing about Dures is it archaeological history. Dures is one of the oldest settlements along the Adriatic coast. So you can visit Amphitheater of Dures, which is the largest in the Balkan Peninsula. On the subject of fresh travel experiences, we've had a question from a viewer who asks very simply, where do you recommend for a first time safari in Africa? The answer has to be a high-end safari lodge in Kenya's Masai Mara, but you will be paying upwards of $1,000 per person per night. At the other end of the price spectrum, for the cost of just a few nights at such a safari lodge, you could get a couple of weeks on an overland truck going through Botswana and Namibia. That's all from Brighton, but do get in touch with any travel questions you might have and I'll do my best to help you. Till next time, I'll hand you back to Eva. Goodbye. Thanks, Simon. Well, to finish this week, we're heading to Australia. 
a place known for its culinary innovation where foodies claim that trends like smashed avocado and flat whites first started. But the latest food fad to come out of Sydney might not be to everybody's taste. We sent Jackie Wakefield to a place where servers definitely doesn't come with a smile. In Sydney, on a warm evening, the streets are buzzing. Post-COVID rules to help cafes and restaurants have been swelling the numbers of people eating and drinking outside all summer. It's part of an effort to support those businesses who still need a bit of help getting back on their feet after the country's long, punishing lockdowns. But one institution doesn't need any of the help. It opened up temporarily during lockdown, became a viral sensation, and now they're opened permanently. And they're expanding branches across the world. And that's despite having some of the worst service you've ever seen. What do we want? Let's go. I'm not getting any younger. Is your name Chad? It's called Karen's Diner, and my mum, dad, and family friend agreed to come with me to brave the onslaught. Oh my God, did you make that shirt yourself? But first, some rules. No racist, sexist, homophobic, ableist comments, no body shaming, no sexual harassment. Any damage or vandalism, you'll be removed. Keep food and drink on your tables and don't throw them. <laughs> All right, we're good. Thank you very much. Word spread fast on social media about the service here, and queues began to form as people decided they'd like a piece of the action. <laughs> to some diners, it's lots of fun, and to others, totally baffling. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but of course, it's all make-believe. Why would you get a vegan burger and then get real cheese? The staff are actors, and it's part of the new wave of theatrical dining experiences that have seen restaurants opening themed around British sitcoms or Broadway shows in recent years. Yes, drink. A mocktail, the special. What is this? I'm not playing charades right now. Use your big girl words. Here, though, you need skin like a rhino. I got there. I mean, it was fun, but tense. How did you feel when they came up and you had to order? Nervous. Especially when they called you something rude. What do they call you? B1. What else? Santa Claus. Grandpa. <laughs> and Mum, what did you get? I, I criticised my clothes. Are we done? <laughs> so what do you say? Thank you. You're welcome. You so Menus together. Nicely, neatly, quickly and quietly. I'm not going to do your job for you. I what do you think is the appeal of the rudeness for customers who come in here? I think people really enjoy having a laugh. It's like some families just have a really, really good time. Like it's not a venue for everyone, but the people that do enjoy it, like it definitely is the space for them. The what? The tropical Karen. All right, you don't need to shout. Do you encourage that? rudeness back? Or? Absolutely, it's so fun when people banter back. It's not very fun when you sit there and they're like, and they just like take it. It's really fun when they banter back, especially if they're like a good table that you get along with and you're able to like establish like some kind of like rapport with them. You can keep coming back and you can keep harassing them. It's always really fun. I've escaped across Sydney for a few moments of sanity and seek out a much friendlier face. Hi, Alana. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thank Alana's you. written about the phenomenon for time out. One of the waiters that we had, he was, he was quite bitchy. I found allowed to say that on the BBC. Um, he, he would kind of just come over and kind of give me up and downs and be like, is that box dyed hair? Do you even know how to blend your eyeshadow? Like, oh, look at your nail beds. Like, oh, like ripping on my cuticles. And I was like, honey, like we're all just out of lockdown. We're still on waiting lists for our usual like nails and hair people. Like I was a little bit like, oh, and I'm like, but um, I had, can say I have worked on my eyeshadow blending technique since that day, so maybe he was doing me a favour. So many people have worked in some service job where mm. they've wanted to kind of talk to customers this way occasionally. Mm. Is there something kind of cathartic in ba being able to see the wait staff act how maybe we would have wanted to act back in that time? I think 100%, like, as a fan of the arts and theatre, like my favourite kind of stuff out there is 
cabaret is really funny burlesque is drag queens doing stupid parodies and I think sometimes the most surreal ridiculous hilarious cathartic entertainment experiences we can have tap into something in reality and I think that there is some kind of great pleasure in seeing that acted out not always when you're on the receiving end of it that can be quite uncomfortable um, but you know if I had to go back to waiting tables tomorrow I think maybe I'd rather work at Karen's Diner than some stuffy high-end restaurant okay who got the burger with stew potato fries of course the staff needs special training to work here who got the salad that kind of breathtaking rudeness doesn't always come easy. Oh, oh. Ryan is a new joiner, and he's come all the way from Ireland for the chance to work here. What age are you? I'm 11. You look five. Don't be smart with me, Grandad. Back home in Ireland, I knew when I was coming to Australia, I was like, I need to get into Karen's. I told everyone I was going to do it. Everyone said to me, no, you need to be an actor. No, you need to have like a background. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to get in. Go sit down. The back table, go sit down, quick, quick. Talk me through what it feels like when you're about to approach a table. That's so rude of you, lass. You have to almost spot straight away what table it is. Is it a bunch of teenagers? Is it a family? Is it a bunch of adults? Oh my God, how many pictures do you want of me? When you first start off being a carrier, you're like a little bit nervous because you're almost doing a performance every time. But once you just come more comfortable with the character, like you go up, you know what works for you, you know what doesn't work for you. You're comfortable in what you know what to do. Messy. Messy. I don't want your leftovers. I think I'm kind of confident enough now that I go up and if they find it funny, don't find it funny, I'm like, this is my character, I know what works. Like it or leave it, I don't care. <laughs> like, That's very Karen of you. <laughs> literally, like sometimes I have to try to separate the character from myself. <laughs> You're not even wearing proper shoes. How are you gonna pay for this whole meal? Right, sadly, our time in Vancouver is at an end, but coming up next time. Carmen is in the Philippines, meeting the cash-strapped pensioners who have decided to supplement their income by discovering their inner diva for tourists in Manila. Until then, you can find us on the BBC iPlayer and on social media too, in all the usual places, along with other great travel content from across the BBC. Well, from me and Senor Cinco right there, goodbye. <laughs>